이어서 다음으로 미국 특허청의 에이미 넬슨 송무수행관님께서 발표 맡아주시겠습니다. 에이미 넬슨 송무수행관님을 단상위로 모시겠습니다. Please come up to the stage. Good afternoon, and thank you very much for inviting me to come to this very interesting uh, conference. I uh, find, feel, very um, feel very pleased to be at this very interesting discourse and having the opportunity to discuss um, the differences between the Korean, the Japanese, and the U.S. patent systems. By way of introduction, I want to explain um, the, the position that I have at the Patent Office. Um, the Office of the Solicitor is responsible for defending the Director of the Patent Office in federal court. And because the Director oversees the, the boards, the, the Patent Board and the, and the Trademark Board, um, we are responsible for defending the boards uh, in district court and in the federal circuit. In addition, we also advise the Solicitor General when there are um, intellectual property issues before the Supreme Court. In fact, we were involved in the Quozo case uh, that is currently before the Supreme Court in helping them to draft the brief uh, to represent the government in that case and prepare for oral arguments. So I spend a lot of my time in front of the Federal Circuit, and I can assure you that being grilled by the judges at the Federal Circuit is quite different from here and um, being before this very friendly audience that I have here. So I enjoy this. Um, I'm going to discuss today, as I've been requested, to talk a little bit about the record before um, the, the Federal Circuit in appeals of board decisions. And then I'm also going to talk about the standard of review and the amount of deference that is given to board decisions. And finally, I'm going to provide a little bit of empirical evidence that will give you a sense of how frequently board decisions are affirmed at the Federal Circuit. Okay, so first, with respect to the um, record, much like the system in Japan, the Federal Circuit um, only reviews um, or looks to the decision of the board um, on appeal. And this is set forth in statute. In Section 144, um, it says that the Federal Circuit shall review the decision from which an appeal is taken on the record before the Patent and Trademark Office. And that statutory section is actually referenced in the other sections that pertain to reexaminations, interim parties um, review, and um, post-grant proceedings. Um, and in fact, the court has held that evidence and arguments are limited to the four corners of the record before the board. And, and when arguments are not raised before the board, they're considered to be waived, except in very, very exceptional circumstances. So the court is quite rigid about that. Um, the record is limited to what is before the board. Um, to begin, I just want to sort of briefly describe the kinds of cases or, or appeals that are taken to the Federal Circuit. Uh, on the ex parte side, there are applications from patent applications and also reexaminations. And in those cases, we as the solicitor's office are um, represent the director who is a party in each and every one of those cases, and we defend um, the patent and trial um, trademark board at the Federal Circuit in those cases. Oops. Um, on the inter-parties side, we still have some um, outstanding IP re-exams. Those are going away with the new a uh, American Invents Act. Um, and we also actually have some interferences that we um, are continue to get appeal to the Federal Circuit. We do not participate on those, in those routinely, but we will participate when there is a significant issue. And now, um, with the AIA proceedings, we have inter-parties reviews. Um, as Judge Kim alluded to, there are also these things called covered business methods, which have a sunset provision in 2020. And these, both of these types of proceedings um, were, could have been initiated any time after September of 20, 
12, so we actually have defended quite a few of those in, for, in front of the Federal Circuit. Post-grant reviews are limited to patents that um, were, are issued under the AIA under the uh, first to file provisions, so we have yet to, uh, we have not yet had an opportunity to defend those in front of the Federal Circuit. In all of these AIA proceedings, we have the statutory right to intervene, and we do intervene, um, particularly when there's an important legal issue that we feel um, we need to um, be heard on. And um, just to give you a sense of how often we intervene in these cases, um, we, you can see um, in blue are the ones where we actually have already intervened, and red are the ones where we're intending to um, intervene. So probably about a third of the inter-parties re-exams we intervene on. Um, and with the new proceedings, the IPRs and the CBMs, we've intervened even a higher rate because they're, they're new proceedings, there's a lot of legal issues to be resolved, and so we've intervened quite a bit. We do anticipate that after some of these issues are resolved, we may not intervene so much, and when there's just simply a factual dispute between the parties about very specific prior art, we generally do not get involved. So with respect to the standard of review, appellate courts have basically four different standards that they use, beginning with a de novo standard, which is essentially giving no deference at all to the lower tribunal, and that's usually reserved to things like to questions of law. Uh, the next standard is the clearly erroneous standard, which is slightly more deferential, and under that standard, the appellate tribunal will not overturn, or will overturn if upon reviewing the entire record, it has a definite and firm conviction that a, a mistake has been made. And that's just the standard that applies when there's a bench trial, when the judge makes findings of fact in district court. Next, the somewhat more deferential standard is the substantial evidence standard. And under that standard, the appellate court will affirm if it has finds some relevant evidence that a reasonable mind might accept as adequate to support the conclusion of the lower tribunal. And that is a standard that has been used when there was a jury and in district court and for its fact findings. And finally, the most deferential is abuse of discretion standard. And in that case, the lower tribunal will not be overturned unless there's been some misinterpretation of law or clear error of judgment. And that usually pertains to things like discovery, trial management decisions, oftentimes things where there is no written opinion by the, the lower court. So um, we know that the de Novo standard, it's a legal, that legal issues are reviewed under the de Novo standard, but what about board fact finding? Well, this was decided in a seminal case in 1999, Dickinson v. Zirko. And that case um, is actually an interesting case. The Federal Circuit um, at that time was kind of varying a little bit about what standard it applied. And in this particular case, it reversed the board's obviousness findings because it found that they were clearly erroneous. And the Patent Office then filed a cert petition and asked the Supreme Court to change, uh, to, to overrule the Federal Circuit because it said it was using the wrong standard. There's an Administrative Procedures Act which was enacted in 1946, and under that act, all administrative agency decisions, um, it actually lays out the, um, the uh, standards of review that are supposed to be used for all administrative agency decisions. And the Supreme Court agreed with the PTO and said, yes, we believe that the APA applies, Section 706 of the APA applies, when the Federal Circuit reviews findings of fact by the PTO. And then following that, the Federal Circuit and Ray Guard side um, decided that, in fact, in the APA, there's actually abuse of discretion and substantial evidence are set out as standards that can be used. And in Guard's side, the Federal Circuit said that substantial evidence should be the standard apply to fact-finding by the board. And that has been the law since 2000. Uh, I just want to mention that Zirko, um, the Supreme Court actually s said they find the difference between clear, ev clear evidence standard, the clearly erroneous standard, and the substantial evidence standard to be pretty subtle. And in fact, they couldn't find any case where a court um, had said that which standard they applied would have affected the outcome. And in fact, in this case, when it went back to the Federal Circuit, the Federal Circuit again affirmed, um, um, 
reversed the board, and this time finding that its findings were not um, supported by substantial evidence. Um, and so all was sort of, we were kind of living under this standard um, until last year, and um, then with the IPR proceedings, there was an interesting pair of cases, no, the Gnosis cases that came out. It was a panel decision, and the panel decided that, just like in guard side, the substantial evidence standard should be applied to IPR proceedings. Uh, Judge Newman, however, dissented and said, well, IPR proceedings are supposed to replace district court proceedings, and therefore, um, it doesn't seem make sense to be applying the substantial evidence standard. A petition for rehearing was, um, on banc was, was filed, but it was denied. But interestingly, there was judge, three judges, Judge O'Malley authored the um, concurrence, and they said, well, we kind of are sympathetic to Judge Newman. Um, it doesn't seem right to be applying the substantial, the substantial evidence standard since these things are so much like district court but we don't think that we can change it um, even if we were to go on banc because we still have the Supreme Court Zerko decision and therefore we're kind of stuck with it. And I just want to point out that under the substantial evidence standard um, where there are two different conclusions that may be warranted based on the evidence of record, the board's decision to favor one conclusion over the other is the type of decision that must be sustained by the court as supported by substantial evidence. So what kinds of issues are legal and which are factual? The court has been pretty clear about this. Anticipation is purely a question of fact. Written description under 112A is also a question of fact. So those get substantial evidence review. Enablement is a mixed question. It's a, the legal conclusion is obviousness. A legal conclusion is, um, is it gets de novo review, but it has um, and underlining factual findings, such as the predictability, the predictability in the art and the amount of guidance and the um, specification, et cetera. And then definiteness is a question of law that is given de novo review. So let me turn now to obviousness. Um, obviousness, since um, the Supreme Court decided this shortly after the 52 Act um, came into being in 1966, it decided much like enablement, that obviousness is a legal conclusion that's based on subsidiary factual findings, um, the scope and content of the prior art, differences between the prior art and the claims, the level of ordinary skill, and secondary considerations. In addition, there are numerous other inquiries that the Federal Circuit has said are factual, whether the prior art teaches away from the claim invention, whether there's motivation to combine references, and whether there is a reasonable expectation of success. Um, and you might ask, with all of these factual findings, what's left into that, in that legal conclusion? Um, well, I guess my answer to that is not much. Um, at the end of the day, I know of no um, decision by the Federal Circuit where it's affirmed the board's obviousness findings as being supported by substantial evidence, but um, overturned the legal conclusion of obviousness. So we, we do find that in obviousness, um, with respect to obviousness, that the board also gets um, a, a great deal of deference. And I just wanted to point out that, uh, reference the KSR decision that you're probably aware of in 2007. Um, this had to do with the, the motivation to combine. And in that case, the Supreme Court rejected the Federal Circuit's um, TSM test, which was um, the Federal Circuit required a teaching suggestion or motivation in the prior art in order to combine references for obviousness. The, the Supreme Court rejected that as rigid and said that in general that a combination of familiar elements according to known methods to yield predictable results um, in a lot of cases will be obvious. And since the time of KSR, um, I think it's safe to say that the examiners have found it easier to write obviousness rejections. The board um, has been able to um, write obviousness rejections and get them affirmed by the Federal Circuit at, at a higher frequency. Now turning to claim construction, which is um, a little bit more complicated, it has kind of a long and sorted history. Um, beginning with Markman in 1996, the Supreme Court um, had to decide the issue before the Supreme Court was whether claim construction was in 
something for the judge or whether it was something for the jury. And Markram, the court said, uh, it is, claim construction is definitely within the province of the court. Um, and after that, the Federal Circuit in a case called CyberCore uh, kind of looked to the Markman and said, well, we don't see anything in Markman where the court uh, suggested that claim construction involved anything, uh, any kind of subsidiary or underlying factual inquiries, so we see it to be a legal question, and therefore we review claim construction de novo. In district court, as um, I think has been discussed, the kinds of things that the courts look to are the claims, the specification, the prosecution, and extrinsic evidence. Um, the question then becomes, well, what, does, what happens at the board? And in the board, um, they do not apply the same Phillips standard. It's been um, a long, over 100 year history, the board has applied the broadest reasonable interpretation. And that's in ex parte applications, it was extended to re-examinations, and then in the IPRs, PGRs, and CBMs, it was actually written into the regulations um, that the broadest reasonable interpretation is applied. So how does the court review this? Well, there's actually been um, several different lines of cases about this. Um, the cases we like the most are ones that um, begin with In Ray Morris in 1997, and, and cases cite to that, and basically they say that the board's claim construction is reviewed to determine whether, it, whether it's reasonable. Um, sounds fairly deferential, and, and it seems to be. Some cases have actually followed the CyberCore line, um, the CyberCore case, and said, no, we review it to Novo, just like in district court. And then there's a few, like NTP, that kind of use a hybrid approach. Well, in Flow Healthcare, there was a case, uh, it's a panel decision, and Judge Plager wrote a concurrence, and he said, look, we have all these sort of different standards, we're not being consistent, we really should go on bonk and, and get this, you know, cleaned up uh, once and for all. Um, however, um, it didn't go on bonk, um, and so we don't really yet quite know, although we tend to continue to cite Morris and try to um, sort of get the court to give us as much deference as possible. Um, then very recently, last year in Teva, the Supreme Court circled back, um, and this had to do with what, whether or not claim construction really is a legal issue and what standard of review should be used in district court. And it said, well, you know, in, in Markman, even though the Federal Circuit sort of went off in CyberCorp and said that we had decided that it's legal, um, we didn't really. We actually, in Markman, we only held the claim constructions for the jury, even where construction has evidentiary underpinnings. And so in TIVA, the court said, it's not entirely legal. Uh, claim construction actually may have some um, factual issues, like for example, when there's extrinsic evidence. Um, and so when there are factual issues about experts, that experts opine on the meaning of claim terms, that we consider to be extrinsic evidence, um, and that is subject, and that is factual and should be subjected to the clear error review, and all of the other evidence, the intrinsic evidence, should be given de novo review. In Quozo, um, the panel actually extended that um, to this, this, this read, this TIVA um, approach, and said that factual determinations by the board, and this was an, an inter-parties review, and it said factual findings by the board in claim construction will be reviewed for substantial evidence, and the ultimate construction reviewed de novo. So we don't know if this is sort of what the Federal Circuit is now going to adopt as sort of the, the ongoing review standard. Um, we'll kind of wait and see, um, but we hope that because it's using BRI, um, that it'll still give some deference to the board. And as I think has been alluded to earlier, two other issues before the court in Quozo were the BRI standard and also whether or not um, it had jurisdiction to review the institution decision. And in that, there was a, there was a um, panel, a, a request for rehearing, and there were several judges that actually descended from that um, about the BRI standard and they argued that, well, this is, these uh, proceedings were meant to replace district court proceedings, so we think the BRI standard is not appropriate. Um, and moreover, this, this limited um, right to amend 
Well, there, it's nothing like during prosecution. Um, so again, these judges all disagreed that BRI was the correct standard. And again, argument was held last month and we do expect a, a decision soon. So just to briefly just show you some empirical data and what this all amounts to is because the board generally gets substantial evidence uh, review to its findings of fact and, um, and also a little bit of deference on claim construction, we've had a very high affirmance rate and this is just showing you proceedings for the last three years in the various types of proceedings and the extent to which they have been affirmed. And this is our own data from our office on the cases that we've been involved in, again showing that we get um, affirmed in, to, to a large extent. Um, and inter parties cases in, in, as well. And not all of these cases, however, get precedential decisions. The court um, does take advantage of its practice under Rule 36 to issue affirmances without opinion, but we have seen with the IPR proceedings um, an increased, um, the, the court has used precedential decisions a little bit more and we hope that continues. It's actually helpful to us to have precedential decisions to cite to in our appeals. So with that, I will leave it and I will save the uh, questions for the panel and during the break. Thank you.